Good evening. My name is Catherine Raff, and I am the Assistant Curator of Ancient Art in the Department of Ancient and Byzantine Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. I would like to welcome you to the museum this evening as we commence the seventh iteration of the Louise Smith Bross Lectures. As many of you undoubtedly know, the Louise Smith Bross Lectureship was endowed by a generous gift from the Bross Family Foundation and is sponsored by the Department of Art History at the University of Chicago. The lectureship, which is held on a triennial basis, serves as an enduring memorial to Louise Smith Bross, who received her PhD in the department in 1994. Louise was passionately devoted to the study and appreci appreciation of the visual arts, as also reflected in her extraordinary engagement with the Art Institute, serving as a volunteer in the Decorative Arts Department, a member of the Women's Board and the Antiquarian Society, and a founder of the Auxiliary Board and the Old Masters Society. One very important aspect of the lectureship is the way in which it brings together the two institutions in which Louise was so deeply involved. It is therefore appropriate that the first lecture in the series is hosted here at the Art Institute, highlighting the collegiality and the increasingly collaborative relationship between the museum and the University of Chicago. I would now like to turn the introduction over to Professor Richard Neer, the William B. Ogden Distinguished Service Professor of Art History, Cinema, and Media Studies and the College at the University of Chicago, who will be introducing our speaker for the series. Please join me in welcoming Richard Neer. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here at the latest iteration of the Bross Lectures and to see familiar faces from Bross's gone by. Um, it is one of the loveliest traditions, I think, that we have here in the city, with bringing together our two great institutions. Um, I'm just going to begin with some very brief vital statistics about Professor Geifman. Millette Geifman took her BA in art history and classics from Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 1997. She then moved on to the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton, where she took an MA in 2001 and a PhD in 2005. After a stint teaching at Corpus Christi College in Oxford, and uh, Corpus is, I should add, um, one of the really important places for studying classical art in the UK, um, she was snapped up by Yale, where she's taught um, in both the Department of Art History and the Department of Classics um, since 2005. She's been promoted several times in Yale's uh, somewhat idiosyncratic system and is now what's called an associate professor with tenure, which is basically the equivalent of a full professor at Harvard, Chicago, or any other place for that matter. Uh, professor Geifman is the author of two monographs, Aniconism in Greek Antiquity, which came out from Oxford in 2012, and last year's The Art of Libation in Classical Athens from Yale University Press. Both books straddle classical archaeology, the history of art, and the history of religion. And both are interested as much in the how as in the what of representation, form, if you will, as much as content. Now, aniconism is a fancy term for images that don't look to us like images at all. In ancient Greece, for example, deities could be worshipped in the form of a rock or a column, or even, in extraordinary cases, an empty space. The Greeks could use one and the same term to describe a statue, a plank of wood, or a slab of stone. So what does it do, Geifman asks, to our concept of a statue or a divine image when we recognize that these symbolic representations were not an early or primitive phase of Greek art, but a continuous option throughout the entire span of Greek antiquity? Were the gods anthropomorphic? Was Greek art really obsessed with the body? Well, yes and no. After Geifman, Greek art is much weirder than we believed hitherto, and our basic categories come to seem much more fragile and in a way more interesting than anyone had ever suspected. Her second book on libations carries forward this project, but with a wholly new set of artifacts. Libation is where you pour out liquid, um, usually alcohol, as a sort of sacrifice. And here Geifman is interested in both the ritual and the objects that you use to perform it. She makes her stance crystal clear in charting three paths of inquiry, that of empirical reconstruction of ancient rituals, of iconography, that is studying the system of imagery of these sorts of rituals without reference really to what might or might not actually have occurred, and then that of what she calls interactivity, or what it was like to use and look at a libation vessel. Religion in this work becomes, uh, sort of provides a kind of concrete vocabulary in which to approach ancient aesthetics. 
Conversely, the history of interactivity is, in Geifman's hands, the history of religion pursued by other means. In essence, she shows how looking at pictures and using tools could be forms of religious practice in antiquity, and in so doing unsettles our encounters with artworks and artifacts alike. The result is a gem of a book that should change the way many scholars and students look at ancient art. But in addition to producing exceptional research under her own name, Professor Geifman is also an unusually generous scholar, an ideal citizen of her field, or should I say fields, plural. This generosity is apparent in her role as the driving force behind a number of edited volumes and special issues of scholarly journals. A special issue is where a journal gives somebody basically the keys to the car, as it were, and that person takes over for one issue, usually to assemble a group of people to address a particular theme uh, 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 or, or topic that seems to be particularly important to current research. It's a kind of work in which the building of a network, of a community, is just as important as one's own personal contribution, which is to say that it's a leadership role. And in Professor Geifman's case, she's on a special issue of the journal Religion on Sacred Images and a special issue of the journal Art History on the relationship between art objects and bodies. And she's also co-editing a major four-volume reference work on primary sources and documents in classical art. On a personal note, I vividly remember my first meeting with Professor Geifman. Um, it was before she was Professor Geifman. It was in the spring of 2005, following a lecture I presented at New College in Oxford. The topic had been classical sculpture, and the Q&A session had been smooth sailing, and I was feeling pretty chuffed after the talk. So I was taken a bit by surprise when at the, end, the reception, this person began politely but relentlessly pressing me on some of my basic assertions. I can still remember the sort of half smile on her face uh, as she basically started playing Jenga with my argument, you know, like pulling out the foundations to see how much she could remove until the whole thing just collapsed. Now, the usual tactic amongst classical archaeologists is to try to poke holes in a speaker's facts or knowledge of the corpus. It's a sort of joust or duel of competitive pedantry. But this person was asking conceptual questions rooted in a thorough acquaintance with archaeological, philological, and art historical literature. There wasn't a trace of malice in it. On the contrary, it was a lot of fun, um, if a bit unnerving. But I learned two things that evening. First, that Malek Geifman was and is really, really smart. Um, indeed, one of the most thoughtful and incisive Hellenists of her generation. Second, that she really likes to argue, but for the very best reasons in the world, which is because she's an intellectual. In the 13 years that have transpired since that night in Oxford, those two points have been confirmed and reconfirmed for me over and over again. And I'm sure they'll be reconfirmed yet again for you to see for yourselves in these lectures that honor yet another smart, incisive scholar, Louise Smith-Bross. Please join me in welcoming uh, Millette Geifman um, as she discusses how to view a dying Isaac monument. My heart, it's, it's, it's too much, as I would say, <laughs> as Gaifun would say, yeah, and she would argue with herself about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you to, to everyone who's here. Uh, lots of friends, lots of faces from different stages of my life. Uh, thank you, first of all, to the Department of Art History, to Alicia and Evan. I haven't seen you, but I know you've been taking care of me, uh, and I really appreciate it. Thank you to Christine Maring, the chair of the department, to Richard Neer, who gave me this, the most generous introduction I could ever uh, hope for. Uh, and thank you for the Bross, to the Bross family for hosting this event. Uh, it's truly a pleasure. and. Uh, I hope uh, you will also get something out of these lectures, um, or whichever lecture you end up attending. So, uh, so really, <laughs> huge thanks. And uh, this event, actually, um, I'm not a person from Chicago, but it gave me the opportunity to enjoy the city a little bit. It's the prime place for the American sky skyscraper. Uh, among the city's numerous architectural landmarks, one is particularly struck a chord with me. Uh, located at 360 Michigan Avenue, a couple of blocks north from he where we are sitting this evening at the Art Institute, this is the London uh, Hotel, uh, London House Hotel. 
Originally named the London Guarantee and Accident Building, a scene in this inscription restored in recent renovation works. It is one of the big four 1920s skyscrapers surrounding the Michigan Avenue Bridge. It's a scene here in this historic, I got the wrong one, uh, picture of the Chicago fog. Here's the London Guarantee House, the Wrigley Building, uh, the 333 Michigan Avenue, and the Tribune Tower. The London Guarantee Building was designed by Alfred S. Altschuler and completed in 1923. Altschuler was a Chicagoan, was even briefly a student here uh, at the School of Art, uh, the Institute. He was invited to design a building that would be in dialogue with the Wrigley Building that was being built then, as a next step in what would become the central urban space of the city. Over the years, Altschuler's creation verse, served verse, the various purposes, including a well-known nightclub, and most recently, it was renovated and transformed into a trendy hotel, I would say. In 2015, apropos these renovation works, the, react, the Chicago Tribune reporter wrote of the London Guarantee and Accident Building and its neighbor, 333 Michigan Avenue, that the presence of the glitzy, outrageously large Trump sign, which the New York developer Donald Trump, this is 2015, yeah, plastered on his nearby mega tower last year, only underscores their regal self-assurance. Undoubtedly, the contrast between the gaudy and the regal is striking. But let us pause and consider the features that endow the old London Guarantee and Accident Building with that regal self-assurance. Al Schiller managed to incorporate ancient forms into this vibrant 1920s American skyscraper. Specifically, <clears throat> um, he included uh, numerous neoclassical features into a structure whose original corporate function as a headquarters of an insurance company and sheer height of 23 stories speaks to its modernity. While celebrating the history of its own locale with its imagery of the old site of Fort Dearborn, seen here, uh, in this bronze relief about the central door, the building also marks numerous references to uh, antiquity. The Grand Corinthian Columns, right here with these acanthus leaves, the marker of the Corinthian Column, uh, appear repeatedly, four here in the facade, and then uh, eight uh, above the 15th floor. I put little arrows there for you to see. There's also a pattern along the roof, here, seen here. Uh, on the right, which is a variant of an ancient pattern we call the meander, whose very long history stretches all the way back to the beginning of the Greek city-state, to the age in which the Iliad and the Odyssey were written and put, were put into writing, circa 750 BCE. On the slide, you can identify that pattern on a funerary vase from circa 750 BCE, where you see the geometric, geometric pattern, and the middle scene shows the presentation of the deceased. There are further decorations that quote from ancient classical visual voca vocabulary. In the background, and I hope you see there is the building, um, and there are garlands here. It's not that very clear, I'm sorry. But the fr front here is from the Arapakis, and it's the same garlands. I went out to take a picture this morning, and it was too, <laughs> the, 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 the current weather wasn't with me. But, <laughs> um, the front is from uh, a, p a, a section from the Altar of Peace dedicated in Rome in 13 BC. And both we see garlands, and between them, there are these uh, ox, uh, uh, skulls of oxen. Those actually go back, of course, to classical Greece. And here I'm showing you uh, a vase from uh, Athens from 5th century BC, where we see a moment before the sacrifice in a sanctuary. On the left, you see the garland, and on the right, above the altar, is the, the skull. The same motif then recurs through the centuries. Such element, as well as the 
building's general proportion speaks to Altschuler's choice in his design to adopt for his project the style of the Beaux-Arts School of Architecture, which was developed in Paris, flourished in the US in the late 19th and 20th century, and was marked by the incorporation of various elements from ancient classical architecture, from Greece and Rome and other ancient sites, as well as Renaissance architecture, and bringing all of these together in the modern age. I hope that by now you can see the appeal of this particular building uh, for the historian of ancient Greek art, who always delights in the revival of ancient visual forms in later periods. But this neoclassical creation, with its mix of various ancient and not ancient Greek and not Greek motifs, makes another allusion to antiquity. The cupola at the top, often referred to as the temple today, a scene here both within and inside, recalls a monument from classical Athens. Its cylindrical form, Corinthian columns, and the two friezes that wrap around its upper part resemble a monument that was still largely, is, is still <laughs> largely intact and easily viewable today at a lovely air, square in the area known as the Placa, near the th southern slopes of the Acropolis. This remarkable monument from the fourth century BCE will serve as the anchor of the series as we explore issues of labels, classifications, and taxonomies in the history of Greek art and architecture. So first, we will take a close look. What makes it so remarkable? <laughs> first, the fact that it's preserved. For even though it underwent a number of restorations and alterations over the century, centuries, most, if not all, of its original elements are still in, there in their original form, even if not fully original, no, not, even if eroded or restored. We see here an original structure from the age of the great philosopher Aristotle, from the renowned rhetorician Demosthenes. It is of substantive dimensions. There's three stories high, or 34 feet tall made of two types of marble, one from Mount Hymetus and, and marble from Mount Penteli. It has its original roof still in place. This is really unusual. Furthermore, unlike so many other ancient monuments, for which we can also only hypothesize a date, an occasion of construction, here no guesswork is needed. Thankfully, there is an inscription on the frieze, something that people like me really love. Uh, that is, if you can read it. <laughs> um, but, but once transcribed and translated, it gives us a lot of information. The last part names the eponymous archon, or the official whose name designated the year and occasion for which the monument was erected. Um, knowing, the, knowing when, who was uh, the archon when, or what we call the archon lists, we can tell that the year is 3354 BCE, and we can assume then that this structure was completely shortly thereafter. The inscription also provides us with the occasion for which the monument was erected. It tells us that a certain individual, Lysicrates, son of Lysiades, from one region of Athens named Kikina, was the Korygos, or the sponsor. Then we learn that a chorus of boys from the tribe of Achamantis was victorious. Now, to really understand this, we need some background information. In Athens, there were annual choral competitions of song and dance in honor of Dionysus, and each team had a sponsor, or a Korygos. In the case of Lysicrates, in here, our case, this was Lysicrates. Each team was also from a specific tribe. In Athens, all the citizens were uh, divided into 10 tribes. So Lysicrates founded the boys' team from the tribe of Achamantis, and happily they won that year. We also learned that one Theon was the accompanying mus musician, and that the director and teacher of the boys was an Athenian li named Lysiades. Altogether, then, this monument, which is shown, known today in the, the literature as the Corrigic Monument of Lysicrates, tells of the victory of the course of the, for the boys of the tribe of Achamantes, sponsored by Lysicrates on an occasion of a song and dance performance in 3354 BCE. Other elements in our monument also evoke the idea of triumph. Around the circular form in between the Corinthian capitals, we see a series of vertical elements that initially may seem just ornamental. But we see here are actually, and these are these details, 
carved in relief are tripods. And they're carved around the entire structure. A tripod is a pole, bowl supported by three legs, hence a tripod, or literally, literally a, a three-footer. We see here uh, that I'm showing you an example here on the right. In Greek antiquity, tripods were of great social significance and had various meanings, not one. But one major one was the fact that they were awarded to winners in various competitions. They were similar to trophies in today's society. The example here shows a tripod from Olympia, from the site of the Olympic Games. And in the slide we see in here, we see many, many tripods that were dedicated, given to the gods in Olympia by athletes hoping to uh, win competitions or thanking the gods for their success. In Athens, on the occasion of the victory of a choral, in a choral competition in honor of, the, of Dionysus, the sponsor of the winning team received a tripod. It is fitting to see tripods on our monument, which celebrate that kind of victory. On the slide here, we see on the right is an image from a vase from the beginning of the 5th century BC. And you see here the god Dionysus holding his distinctive goblet. And he's holding, he has um, the ivory branch. He's got a beard in this case. And next to him is a satyr. This is one of his companions. These are half animals, half men. Note the tail, and he has also pointed ears. The satyr uh, holds a, a tripod, and we presume then that the, the vase references somehow the kind of a, victor, a victory, a Dionysiac victory. But satyrs and Dionysus also appear on our monument. And for this, we will need to get a little closer. So what we have here, um, and we're going to go even further in, and right above where the inscription is, we see, we see something that the most eroded part, which is obviously the most important part. Um, and what you have to make out here is um, the um, uh, silhouette. So there's a reclining figure right here, and actually, this is the head, but that's really hard to see. But you could see that this is the head of one of the accompanying figure, and there's one that's even bigger. And if you don't believe me, then I'll show you the plaster cast, where you can bet to get a better ID. The figure is larger than all the others, and you can see the outline of the head compared to the other one next to it. Um, and there's also some kind of animal. You can guess that. Now, this is really the worst, the the most damaged part of the entire relief. Um, and here I've added to our sequence the dr drawing that was made uh, in, the, in 1762 of this relief to make things uh, easier uh, for us to read this. And the artist added some ideas of his own. That's clear, but the details remain. A youthful male nude figure reclining on a fabric holding a bowl in the company of what appears to be a panther. That this is Dionysus is suggested by the general context, already implied by the inscription. The fact that he's bigger than all the other figures, and that is the distinction of gods, uh, typically in situations like that. And the fact that the animal is supposed to be a panther because that would be the uh, natural uh, animal to be in the company of the god in such a scene. Now, on either side of the god, we also see satyrs. So if we go here on, yeah, so I'm, first I'm going to go to this part, to all the way there, um, and we see a satyr next to, um, so this is this scene, and he's a satyr, and you can identify him by the tail, this is the original, and you, have, you see here uh, a mixing bowl for wine and water, and, and he's drawing it holding a cup, a uh, bowl, sorry. And then on the other side of, Dion so here was the main scene with Dionysus. Here are sitting, there's a seating, seated satyr, and there's another one uh, who is drawing uh, wine from another uh, crater, another mixing bowl for wine and water. So, so far, this seems like a very charming scene. The god, when you're having wine, they're reclining. But there, then there are scenes of violence. Quite. Yeah, and you can start getting an idea of that right there. Um, we see these satyrs chasing men. And um, 
And as we, they move around them and they use these kinds of branches, you see them taking, holding the trees and trying to get branches and they chase these poor men right here. And there's more, you see this satyr holding the branch and chasing that man. It's very weird, don't you think? And then there's more. There's this detail here in the middle. What the hell is that? Well, there is the uh, drawing from the 18th century that's supposed to help us. And in fact, what we see here is a dolphin with human legs. Um, so what the hell is going on here? Well, this striking relief references a story, the first known in the 6th century BC, from a hymn to Dionysus. The story tells of pirates who tried to abduct um, the god. They put him on a ship, and they put him in chains, but the bonds just loosened. And then the sea changed into wine. Grape vines appeared everywhere. The, gripe, the god transformed into a roaring lion. A bear appeared on the ship. And then the frightened pirates, they tried to jump off the ship, and they were turned into dolphins. The only one who was saved from becoming a dolphin was the helmsman who recognized that the abducted prisoner was none other than the god himself, Dionysus. This is a powerful story that articulates the triumph of the god and the importance of recognizing him. And I, so here we have the reference on the relief. Uh, and this is the most recent photograph. And you can see the um, dolphin, half dolphin, half man. But I can't really, I, there's no way to tell the story without showing you this cup. It's a classic, which is today in Munich. And it was made right around the time which we, from which we have the uh, text from, uh, of the Homeric, the hymn to Dionysus. And uh, here we see Dionysus reclining. Uh, he's surrounded by dolphins. And I actually will show you a photograph I took. And I, probably, I know it's bad because it's from within the glass case, but I just want you to see how deep this is. And then imagine it filled with wine. Dionysus reclining in the sea of wine, surrounded with dolphins. He's holding his horn of plenty on a ship, which has two little dolphins also uh, decorating it. And these are not just then dolphins. These are the pirates having been transformed into dolphins. On our monument, the relief captures the very moment in which the pirates were turned into dolphins, the very instant of transition. The cup gives us this wonderful aftermath. Here we are in mid-action. And indeed it appears that the relief presents a different variant of the stories as we see star the, the satyrs chasing the pirates on land and that the dolphin jumps into the sea. So this is not exactly the same uh, 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 version. Since Isocrates' team won a competition of a song and dance in which hymns in honor of Dionysus were performed, we may say then that the imagery perhaps be, could be related to the hymn that was performed. And maybe then that they performed some kind of version of that story. Whatever the case may be, the relief evo evokes the same story in the triumph of Dionysus. So here we have a Dionysiac victory in imagery and in text. Uh, and you can see some more. But then there's even more. <laughs> Looking, let's look now at that roof with that uh, interesting uh, floral uh, part at the top, uh, which was made out of a single marble block. And you can see here that there are detective cavities that suggest that a tripod was originally sta standing there. So we can surmise that, what, as was customary at the time, Lysicrates placed the tripod he won on, uh, on that occasion on the top of this monument, and because this was not unusual. That's what you, normally people did. That's how sponsors of winning uh, uh, teams uh, showed, uh, celebrated their victories. Um, this, his tripod is estimated to have been about three meters tall or 10 feet high and was placed at the top. Now this is one reconstruction, but I also am showing you two versions, since although everyone agrees that there was a tripod at the top, there's no question about that, 
We, of course, disagree on how precisely that was positioned. As you can see on the right, um, the German reconstruction suggests the additional figures, supporting figures. And this is the French version, where, which situates the tripod directly there. Here you also can tell that uh, we are not today, the monument is completely closed, but according to Heinrich Maurer's archaeological work, it was likely open on one side and may have had a statue inside, as seen here in this reconstruction. However, we think about the original, wh whether partly open or completely closed as it is today, it can, we can imagine it with a large bronze tripod on the top. Standing tall at a crossroads in ancient Athens, it asserted a victory, a Dionysiac triumph. So here we have the mon monument of my title, a Dionysiac monument. But then what the hell was that about the Chicago thing? <laughs> well, of course, I wanted to bring you in here <laughs> to get your attention. But yes, there is also the, this is a case of Greek uh, revival uh, in American architecture. You can also say that the cupola, or the so-called temple of Michigan Avenue, marks a site of Dionysiac rituals and celebrations at the hotel's rooftop, a place even, uh, for even triumphant occasions. Since I gather on certain evenings, it's a true feat to, get a, to manage to get a seat there, not to, manage the, not to mention the marriage proposals inside the cupola that have become a local tradition. But there's more to this, however. I began with this comparison in order to get us to think together on the ways in which we view monuments from the past. Turkey, taking my prime example is this Athenian monument, a structure that celebrates a choral victory. The comparison between our 20th century structure and its ancient source of inspiration exemplifies the issue of modes of viewing. Some of you may uh, rightly uh, object to this comparison. You would say, well, there are some similarities, um, but then you may also say the two structures are not really identical. One is open, the other closed. One is made of modern materials, the other from two types of Greek marble. Uh, one has an interesting relief with tripods and the whole story. The other has these wreaths and circular forms. Alshuler did not really copy this Greek monument. Rather, he incorporated sufficient elements that suggest similarity. He created a variation on a theme, which emphasizes certain aspects of the model or source and does away with others. There's a selection here. Obviously, Alshuler's decision-making process was guided by a range of goals and constraints, but the result suggests a certain engagement with particular elements from ancient uh, from ancient Athens. Notably, Alshuler no quoted saying that the cupola was intended to be in relation to the building, the Wrigley building, which was also, which also has Corinthian columns at the top, but in circular form. But then there are other models that were incorporated there. So we have a whole mishmash of things going on in this Chicago Highland. Um, and actually, in Chicago itself, on the occasion of the 1893 Chicago Expo, um, the 400 years for the expedition of Christopher Columbus, uh, and here is one of the photographs from uh, that occasion, yes, there was, among the monuments, a full copy of the monument of Lysicrates. So we can assume um, that this was known. The, the, furthermore, the monument of Lysicrates was also described in detail in one of the major publications one, by one of the Beaux-Arts School of Architecture, one of the teachers, uh, Georges Grandmont, in his Choix d'éléments empruntés à l'architecture classique, pu published originally in French in 1904. In this illustrated work, intended for recent graduates of the school, our monument appears as exemplary of Corinthian columns in Greek antiquity. From the perspective of the Beaux-Arts School of Architecture, witnessing its tr instructional texts and its in implementation in Chicago and elsewhere, the ancient monument is characterized by its columns and circular form. And although Grammont mentions the inscription and the occasion for which the monument was originally erected, he does not acknowledge the tripods or the relief. From his perspective, our monument is above all else a classical architectural model. 
an early example of the Corinthian order. It is also a marker of some democratic traditions of Athens, but that of less significance. What is fascinating here is a kind of selection process whereby certain elements are highlighted and others completely ignored. With this instant of American neoclassicism, then, I invite you to consider with me other ways in which the art and architecture from the past was viewed, described, and then classified. Using the monument of Lysicrates, which, with which you are very familiar now, um, as a, our prime example. Here, a word must be said about the title of the series, Classification and the History of Greek Art. The act of classifying is crucial for any area of inquiry. Inevitably, we must organize and label the subjects of our research and the world around us. This is almost too obvious, uh, especially to those who are engaged in histories of, uh, and philosophies of science. And I suspect some of you here may think of Michel Foucault's Le Mot et les Choses, first published in 1966, and is in his English translation, uh, The Order of Things. What Foucault highlighted from the onset it was the role of nomenclature, the choice of names in the process of scientific in inquiry. These are issues that actually go all the way back, of course, to ancient philosophy. The choice of categories articulates the war ways we are of looking at the world. In this series, I would like for us to think together about the categories we deploy in the study of Greek, of art, of the art of ancient Greece and how they have shaped and still informed the histories that are being written. Today, we will be conducting some time travel, moving from the early 20th century to the age in which the Monument of Lysicrates was constructed in the fourth century BC, and then we will progress speedily, very speedily, don't worry, uh, until the moment in which the, it received its first comprehensive study in 1762. This will be our first step in the series and considered how modes of viewing and labeling shape perceptions of art and architecture in particular contexts, whether political, religious, or cultural. In the lecture, lecture, I will discuss how the monument fits within the categories and classifications in the field of Greek art and architecture, particularly from the 18th to the 20th century, and thereby explore the fundamental role of taxonomies in shaping our scholarly inquiry. We will consider the advantages and limitations of taxonomizing. In the final lecture, we'll try to consider ways in which we can build upon ex existing classifications and at the same time, maybe go a little bit beyond them. So how was the monument of Lysicrates viewed? <laughs> well, the first comprehensive account of our monument, as I said, is from 1762 in a publication by James Stewart and Nicolas Rivet, true uh, uh, British architects who spent time in Athens in the 18th century, when Athens was under Ottoman rule. Um, and where they told their readers, and this is, in the, uh, this is what you see on the screen, that the locals call the monument the Fanary of Demosthenes, or the Lantern of Demosthenes, but they also said that this, is, uh, this idea was utterly absurd and hardly deserves any attention. Next week, on Monday, we will return to these remarks, which speak to a profound gap between the view of the natives and the foreigners, between local lore and also those who are fascinated, and those who are coming to provide proper empirical documentation and give full account in the way, the real way of understanding the past. So this is coming up on Monday. But today, we perhaps will focus on the more the fun part, the local lore, the native view, and also the tourists' eyes, which also shaped later perceptions of our monument and ultimately led to the adoption and fast, uh, of it in Europe and in, uh, here in the United States. So we're back, going back in time to the, here's a classic shot of the Athenian Acropolis. And our monument is not described in ancient, any ancient texts. But I, could, I wish to tell you a little bit of what we know about the context in which this monument was um, erected. It was one among numerous monuments that, or structures that stood around the theater of Dionysus. This is shown here on the slide. Um, that various types, I mean, um, and most of them are just small blocks, so there's no point, in, they're not very visually interesting, um, um, that stood around the theater Dionysus where the performance took place. And they were intended to support bronze tripods, the trophies that were awarded to the sponsors. 
This street where these monuments stood was known, at least from the second century CE, as the Street of the Tripod, highlighted here on the map. And uh, in this slide, yeah, I'm showing you here this sort of the um, plan where our monument is seen as the circular form, and next to it, all kinds of these bases for trophies. So it was one among many. It's higher, but among others. <laughs> Uh, in fact, in Athens today, there is still a street known as Tripodion. This is where my arrow there, and the blue arrow is, and the Lysicrates monument, marked in red here, is on that street. So our monument was among other such structures. We cannot tell what the Athenians said about it, but we know what, how, how, it, how it came into being. And here we need a little bit of Athenian cultural and uh, political history. So under an Athenian uh, democracy in the fifth and fourth centuries BC, citizens of a, le a certain level of income, and that's at least three talents, and what is th that, that were ex expected to contribute to the state uh, and to sponsor uh, festivals and uh, military um, uh, expeditions. A simpler way, so three talents is about 26 kilos of pure silver, the value of that, and that's hard to gauge. So a different way of thinking about it is that we're about 300 male citizens in Athens of the fourth century BC who were in, within the ability to finance and make such sponsorships of the army and the festivals. The estimated size of the population was about 150,000 people with 30,000 30, uh, citizens among them. And this is a high uh, estimate. This is her, uh, there's another estimate of 20. So we're looking at the top 1% of the citizenry who could actually sponsor festivals. And this is where Lysicrates was. Now, it's interesting that even if you didn't have the money, you could be a funder or a sponsor. Uh, in fact, Plato himself uh, served as a choregos of a boys' choir, as in, and he borrowed money from Dion of Syracuse, a non-Athenian. So there was a lot of politics involved in that. That was an honor and a privilege. And this was part of the festival of the city Dionysia, when the Athenians had their theatrical and choral competitions. This is when the famous Greek plays were performed. Um, there were competitions of so-called dithyrams. These are the songs in honor of Dionysus and tragedies and comedies. At the time, the entire population, as I said, was divided the, uh, into 10 tribes. And the festival then of Dionysus in each tribe had two teams, one chorus of men and the other chorus of uh, boys. Each one had 50 uh, participants. In addition, there were other the competitions, of course, between the tragedians and the comedies. So, and the choruses were not, and the sponsors then were nominated by the tribe. So there's a whole of the inside workings here that come across when we think of Lysicrates. Did he have to be selected by the people of the tribe of Acamantis? We can also know that he had to be above 40. Why is that? Because according to the law, uh, of the fourth century BC, a sponsor of a boys' chorus was required to be above 40 in order to prevent him from sexual advances. So that uh, seems very apt to think about that today. Um, actually, there were all kinds of legislative measures to protect boys from uh, un unwanted sexual advances from their teachers. There was a thought that after 40, it's all gone, obviously. Once appointed, Lysicrates was paired with the po poet and who wrote the song and the musician Theon, who mentioned in the inscription. The sponsorship then was more than just about money. Uh, here I've got the inscription. It was much more than just money. It was about finding 50 competing boys, finding rehearsals place, selecting the teacher, getting the costume designers, oversee the boys' diet, making sure that they conform to choral order, that they perform as a team. These actually had a huge, these competitions for boys 11 and 17, and imagine, imagine managing 50 boys in that age group, were immense educational significance for the city as a whole. Now, given that every year there were 500 boys competing, 10, 50, 10 tribes, 50 boys from each, most Athenian men had undergone this experience. This was the educational endeavor of the city. 
And think about the value of athletic and musical competitions in today's American educational system. There's an echo of that here already, or precedent. During the festival, of course, Eliza Cortez would have been among the dignitaries and once awarded the tripod, he, uh, play, he then managed to secure a nice place in a, a place for his monument to support it in this nice location. But I still didn't answer what they said about it. <laughs> well, I know what they thought about the tripods. The texts from the era focus on the tripods, which reference the official records and, and the official records as prizes of victory, Niketeria. We can also get an idea about their significance from one of the speeches of Demosthenes, the great orator, here, seen here on a statue from the Roman era. Um, in a trial speech, either from the 340s or the 320s, on behalf of an anonymous plaintiff, Demosthenes accuses a fellow citizen, his name is Phinepos, for claiming to be poorer than he actually was. And he did that in order to avoid making contributions to the state to avoid the duty of known as the liturgies. Or in today's terms, Demosthenes, in this speech, Demosthenes was charging Phinepus for a kind of tax evasion, if you like. But how could Demosthenes prove that? How he didn't have tax records or anything? The, um, well, addressing Phinepus, he said, your fathers were possessed of such wealth that each of them set up a tripod in honor of courageous victories at the Dionysia. And I do not begrudge them this, for it is a duty of the wealthy to render service to the state. Having a tripod in the public square is both a marker of wealth and status and duty and service. It's all of this. As Peter Wilson pointed out, the classical text in the classic, no one brags about his own riches. The tripods are connected to one's own heritage. They are markers of family wealth. This is an inherited privilege and duty. The wealthy were expected to make the contribution to the state and put their words on display. This process glorified the individual man, the tribe of the winning team, the musician and the teacher, but ultimately it celebrated the workings of Athenian democracy in honor of Dionysus. This dynamic generated the creation of various types of support, sometimes elaborate, like, our, uh, like the one by uh, uh, Lysicrates. We may turn to ancient vocabulary to the term mnemata or memorials that may be useful here in capturing this, the monuments that supports a uh, role in commemorating the moment. We could also think of them as honoring the god whose hymn was sung on the occasion of victory and whose image is shown in relief in our monument, the monument of Lysicrates. We can also think of them in terms of Athenian identities in a particular historic context. The year 3354 BC, when the course of, Achaemant of boys of Achaemantes won, was right about when Alexander the Great gained great power. The young man from Macedon was soon to conquer all of Greece, Egypt, Asia Minor, the entire Persian Empire, basically the entire world from the Greek perspective. Athenians have already experienced the threat from the north from uh, Alexander's father when they, along with other city-states, were defeated by Philip of Macedon in 338 BCE, after which all Greek city-states signed a peace treaty under the hegemony of the Macedonian kings. They kept their autonomy, but soon after Philip's death in 336 BC, the Sisti state of Thebes attempted to undermine that peace treaty and was crushed militarily by Alexander, the, the, Alexander the Great, Philip's successor. Still, they, and so the Athenians were aware of that, and, but they, and they kept to their autonomy and democratic institutions, including the annual festival. In light of this, some scholars would say, well, the Athenians were trying, someone like Lysicrates was trying to be regal, showing off, putting up a high monument like that, um, being influenced by that Macedonian uh, regal uh, style. Others see it as an, you could see it also as an Athenian self-assertion of the power of the citizenry to contribute to public life, even at a grander scale. In fact, um, however we view it, we can see that this tradition continues well after uh, uh, the death of Alexander the Great. Uh, two monuments, one has not survived, this is from 320, 319 BCE. There's a monument of Nikias for which has not survived. 
Uh, but you can see there is reconstruction. And here on the foot of, this is on the slopes of the Excropolis, the monument of Thrasyllus, and here is the reconstruction with the tripod on the top. Now this is a temple look-alike. These both are reconstructed as something that looked like a temple, but actually wasn't, because it wasn't very deep. There's not much state space. And on top of it was a tripod. Now to remember these and keep them in mind as I move on in time into the Roman era and to the travel writer Posenus who wrote the descriptions of Greece in, in the second century CE. In this text, we find the mention of the street of the tripods, still that name that is still used today. And like the tourists in this picture, Pausanias offers uh, the traveler's point of view of ancient Greece. In an age in which it was no longer independent, being under Roman rule. As Pausanias writes, leading from the Pritaneum, Pritaneum is the place where the civic officers uh, sat through the year, that's the chief civic center. Um, so from the Pritaneum is a road called Tripods. The place takes its name from the shrines, large enough to all tripods of bronze, which stand upon them, but containing very remarkable works of art, including a satyr of which Proxiteles is said to have been very proud. This is actually a very complicated passage, but note the shift here from the text, from what we've seen from the fourth century BC, where the discourse is on tripods themselves, to something else. Pausanias doesn't care who won, how, uh, is it from wealth. He focuses on the monuments themselves and calling them naoi, shrines. They are said to be large enough to hold bronze tripods. This description certainly, set, certainly echoes the appearance of monuments such as that of Thrasilos I just showed you. And one would say also the monument of Lysicrates. These, are, these look like temples, but they're not really temples. There was hardly any room to move inside them. The monument of Lysicrates was high above ground level, was not designed for regular entry. They look like temples. They are, Posenius, the way he uses the word naos or shrine, is similar to the way we use the term temple when we talk about the cupola at 360 Michigan Ave. It is a temple look-alike, not really a site of worship. Still, in our context, unlike in our context where really we don't worship and, if, and, if, and if anything, maybe wine, those who drink there, uh, um, in Posenius' day, shrines did serve worship. They did worship Dionysus. His use of the term naos then associates the structure with religious meaning. Notably, the entire area where our monument stood was also where the processions in honor of the god took place. He also mentions the statues of a statue by the great master Praxiteles, one of the most famous artists of the fourth century BCE. That he said was, some, and he says he said there were some great artworks that were on this stored in these naoi on the streets. Here we have then the civic, the, those are the tripod, the sacred in the naoi, and the artistic coming together. Witness on this Athenian street from the traveler's point of view in the second century e CE. The issue of religion becomes all the more pertinent when we turn to what appears to be the earliest direct reference to the monument of Lysicrates. That is in the 12th century CE, the period in which Athens was part of the Byzantine Empire and, uh, and was Christian, of course. My dear colleague Rob Nelson, whom I think many of you here know, tells me that, and this is quote, Byzantine Athens was pathetic. <laughs> there was nothing there. He really said it that way. <laughs> Thessaloniki was the true center of the Byzantine world. Well, something was there. There were churches built, uh, and this is one of them, Panagia, the Church of Panagia Kapnika Rea, founded in circa uh, 1050 CE, and this is located today at the edge of the same area, the Plaka in Athens, the same area as the monument. In the 12th century CE, uh, Michael Koniatis, a learned churchman originally from Asia Minor, came to Athens and was the bishop from around 1182 to 1204 CE. In his first address to the Athenians, probably delivered in 1182, Koniatis pointed out to his audience that their city's landmarks, 
uh, pointed their city landmarks, but he told them that it's not because of the Acropolis or the Piraeus that they are well reputed, but because of their virtues and vi wisdom. And he also mentioned in that context, the lamp of Demosthenes. Lucnos Demosthenes, the lamp of Demosthenes. As I mentioned earlier, Stuart and Rivette in the 18th century noted that local Athenians called the monument of Lysicrates the lantern of Demosthenes. And indeed, later writers and earlier refer continuously to our monument as the lamp, the candle, the lantern of Demosthenes. This long tradition of local lore reported by travelers is really perplexing. Why lamp or lantern? Why Demosthenes? For a lantern or a lamp, we can think perhaps that in the eyes of the Athenians, perhaps if, especially if they thought of the tripod at the top, that it may have resembled a lantern in, in their form, as also being tall. Uh, perhaps Demosthenes, because it was from the fourth century BCE, and perhaps because he was a famous figure, that's, that makes sense, sort of. But we can be a little bit more specific. We should note that the word for lantern most often used in these references is the word fanari, which means a lighthouse. But OK, but then in Constantinople, that big capital of the Byzantine pa Empire, today's Istanbul, there was also a district known as the fanari. And where affluent Greeks lived, there was a thriving community. In fact, until today, Greeks from Istanbul, from this part of it, are known as the Phanarites. I even have a colleague who is a Phanarite. I don't know even how to say Phanarite. From this perspective, if we think about it from the Byzantine context then, our landmark, landmark in Athens called the Phanari would evoke a parallel to the great place in the capital, an Athenian Phanari. And they're saying that, like Constantinople, Athens also has its fanery, and it makes sense. The fanaries, are, are, those live in the fanery in Constantinople, were Greeks. And why Demosthenes? Well, we could think great, makes sense in general. But we can, uh, but perhaps the 12th century mention of an oil lamp of Demosthenes can help us a little further. Anthony Caldelis and others have argued that for Byzantine churchmen, Demosthenes, in particular, represented an ideal figure from the classical past. He could be construed as the model for priests. He was the great orator in whose footsteps Christian preachers could follow. In fact, the reference to an oil lamp in the speech is also telling, for Coniatis was a learned man himself, and he read, he read classical literature. And he read the Greek uh, writer from the Roman era, Plutarch, who wrote of that Demosthenes, the great speechmaker, was famous from smelling of the oil of his lamp. He was reputed for not speaking spontaneously in public, but he would not, as he would not put himself in front of the podium without proper preparation. He was famous for sitting with his oil lamp through the night, carefully crafting his words. For the church father, then, the lamp of Demosthenes marked the great tradition of studiousness and oratory that a Christian preacher would aspire to continue and instill in his audience. The context of the landscape of that pathetic Athens of the Byzantine era, the details regarding our monument, its form, shape, or precise circumstances of creations of, were of least importance. Rather, the lamp of Demosthenes was there to designate the Athenian spirit its immaterial forces, its oratory, studiousness, and language. One should note that the ancient Greek, uh, also another figure that is often, uh, sometimes, but less often, associated with our, modern, uh, uh, our monument is Diogenes, another figure who is highly admired by Christian uh, fathers and, uh, and by the church. Moving in our time machine, we meet an Italian traveler, Siriaco di Pizzicoli, or later known as, better known as Siriaco Vancona, who lived uh, in the 15th century. 
And armed with ancient texts, such as the natural history by the Roman writer Pliny, traveled across the Mediterranean in the 15th century and recorded all the antiquities he saw, gems, bits and pieces, architecture, coins, sculpture, and even some exotic animals. He also was a lover of inscriptions. He collected all of his unedited records in notebooks that he called commentaria, which came together into large, six large uh, volumes, over most of it was destroyed in a fire. He called his artifacts the relics of sacrosanct antiquity. And that gives a different tone to the looking at the monument now. When he traveled to Athens in 1436, he saw our monument and made, this is perhaps the first rendition that we find here in this slide on the left. And those of you who can read Greek, you could see Lysicrates. And if you don't read Greek, you could see something that looks like an A, that's an alpha right there. He actually identified the name, but he didn't make more of that. For the first time then, we have evidence of an engagement with the epigraphic habit of classical antiquity. We begin to see the seeds of close study of the past, of that sacrosanct past. Still, as this image of a female statue right next to it suggests, uh, this was part of a large, large mix of all kinds of ancient things that were not yet sorted through. There, were no, there was no engagement in classifications. As we move in time then, to, uh, the lantern on Demosthenes continued to be the most common title used for a monument. And we're moving quickly to the 17th century, where when in 1669, a French Capuchin order acquired the land where the monument stood and incorporated it in its grounds. Here we see an image published in 1858 where you can see the monument, the silhouette of the monument incorporated within the uh, monastery. Notably, the French, uh, the father of the order who purchased the land, claimed that the one condition for the acquisition was the preservation of the monument. The monastery became a home of travelers and visitors. The one, one of them was a soldier who actually uh, was escaped, a Prussian soldier, who in 1674 escaped slavery and came there, and he was the first to decipher the entire inscription. Later, uh, in the year 1675, uh, a French, uh, 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 Jacob Spahn and uh, George Wheeler, a Frenchman and a British man, uh, were there and, uh, and managed to stay in Athens and stayed in the monastery. And in this slide, I'll show you their rendition of the same monument. Here, they also reported about that lantern of Demosthenes that the, uh, the locals also say that was the study of Demosthenes. Mind you, the Capuchin orders, they've transformed the space into a little study. So now we can imagine Demosthenes actually staying there and spending time there. It's a small library. Spawn to describe the Strex and was the first to hypothesize it was a victory monument. By contrast, he thought that the relief depicts the labors of Hercules. So that, and he didn't really give a complete account. At this time, the monument then acquired an additional dimension. It was the heart of a fascination in learning about Greek antiquity, as well as the European quest for ownership of bits and pieces of classical antiquity, both literally and culturally. In 1762, as I mentioned before, the title Corrigic Monument was coined by Stuart and Rivette, yet the fanari of Demosthenes continued to shine brightly, even beyond Athens. In 1771, and this is uh, um, a lantern of Demosthenes, and this is still how it's called, was erected in Staffordshire, England. And across the channel in 1803, a terracotta model of the monument was displayed in Paris and drew the attention of none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. He was so impressed that he ordered to have a, a tower erected at the Parc de saint Cloud and place that copy of the lantern on top. So here is a drawing of the Parc de saint Cloud in Paris at the time in the 19th century. The lantern was lit whenever the Napoleonic Council met. So from an idea of a lantern, it became a real lantern right there, a marker of French government. That tower was destroyed during the Prussian War in 1870, so all we have are these such records from the 19th century. 
And back in Athens, the lantern of Demosthenes continued to serve the monastery. And I said that he served as a study. One of the people who stayed there was none other than Lord Byron. So it became known as, the, as Lord Byron's study, or perhaps bedroom. And there's even uh, some American uh, professor from John Hopkins who in 1896 said it could not be a bedroom because a bed wouldn't fit there and gave all the measurements. So big debate. This is scholarship. Um, and after Greece got its, got its independence from the Turks, the Congress was destroyed. Um, and, uh, but the French, however, held it as their own. And they were proud for having saved it from the P Lord Elgin, the same man who took the Elgin marbles to Athens. He also wanted to bring that monument to, uh, from, from Athens to London, to the British Museum. But the French didn't let, let him. And they're very proud of it. It's the property of France, which conserved it intact nearly two centuries, and that wanted to return it to the reborn Greece. And here is a slide uh, that is, shows you that after restoration, this is a lantern uh, slide from the 19th century. I'm not sure about that date, but you can see that it's post-restoration, and there's a fence around it. And that was the work of the French uh, before returning it to Greece. And that still is there in the scholarship. There's French pride connected here. Now, I cannot end this without mentioning another place where you can find a copy of the Monument of Lysicrates. There are plenty of them. One of them is, and of course, in the US, plenty. And this is the state capital of Tennessee. It was designed by William Strickland. And the upper part has the same circular form and Corinthian columns. And this building also features in such pi uh, pictures from the Civil War. And even on this banknote uh, from uh, that era. Local pride, if you like. We have trouble uh, in time today trying to get a grasp of a very long history of the perceptions and receptions of one Athenian monument that could play a social role, political role, it could be thought through various lenses, a product of Athenian democracy, religious festival, marker of culture, Greek learnedness and oratory, or an icon simply of classical architecture that can be replicated in various ways. But perhaps this evening, we may also want to think about it as a reminder of the importance of sponsorship, of those who are giving, endowing, and allowing us to have occasions like this. Those whose generosity allows us to continue with our educational efforts and the study and love for the arts. Please join me in thanking the Frost family for allowing us to have this occasion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Millet. We have time for um, a couple questions, if there's any questions or comments um, from the audience. I mean, the idea, the, now everyone believes the German archaeologist who claims that it was open. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. There's evidence, but it could, we actually can reconstruct it in different ways. The point is, it was mostly enclosed except for one part that may have been or likely was open. But you could also think about it as having had doors, perhaps, or some other closure right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, if you would have, yeah. That, and, and the fact, and the Capuchin order had it open. So I'm not against it. I'm just saying that the reconstruction with that statue and that sort of gets it a little beyond what the evidence say. But yes, you're right. A lantern could be that too. I, I, I left it open on, on purpose. Absolutely. Thanks. Oh, no, no, no. There, there was a copy. There was a terracotta model that was just destroyed in the Prussian War. Okay. That was a... No, 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 no. They all, it, it stayed. It's okay. still there. Uh, sorry if that wasn't clear, so that's kind of bad. Okay. But uh, yeah. no, no, that was just to show that this same monument is copied in multiple places. Uh, I, I start off with the Chicago Hotel, uh, but actually, it start, you start looking at it, you'll find it almost, every, it's a project of its own. It's yeah, fun. Super proud of their copy. Yeah, that French, yeah, and they turn it into the sort of Napoleonic um, model. Yeah, lantern. So a lot of it is actually uh, maintained in its original. Some of it was uh, altered, um, like for the, for example, the frieze of the tripod. So there's a section that's still fourth century BC, 
uh, and some was added on. Um, but they actually are very proud, and that was part of the rhetoric, that they haven't altered it. They kept it intact. The interior, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't go too much into that, because there's evidence it was used as a library. But, um, but the exterior, the form, the wall, especially the roof and the inscriptions, these are all original. In general, first of all, you could think the terrain is not identical to what it was in the fourth century BC, and there's more archaeological work that has been done there. Uh, and when one has to take the viewer's point of view. I've talked, used today, I actually really looked at the sort of the language used, uh, which actually doesn't really engage with um, how people really saw what they saw, but because they didn't, stay, but what they saw is what they tell us they saw. So with that, please join me again in thanking Malek Eifman and also the Bross family and the Art Institute for this wonderful event. <laughs>